welcome to the Longest Day podcast. I'm Leah, your host and the founder of Broadstairs Consulting. We are an advisory and mediation consultancy, bringing clarity, focus, and momentum to organizations by helping leaders find creative solutions that work. We help rebuild relationships and facilitate effective dialogue. We are convinced that people matter and that conversations count, so we started The Longest Day, a series of conversations where we learn from the resilience, determination, and candor of our guests. As they look back on their longest days, our hope is that it will empower you to look forward. We hope their stories will be a part of shaping yours. Today's podcast guest is Naomi Smith, CEO of Best for Britain, the UK's leading nonpartisan advocacy group upholding internationalist values. Naomi is also the founder of Trade Unlocked, which has created a platform to bridge the gap between the worlds of business and politics. It enables businesses of all sizes and from all sectors to give views on what they need from the UK government to get their business and the economy growing. She is the former executive director of campaigns at the business lobby group London First. Prior to focusing on her campaigning work, Naomi qualified as a management accountant and spent 15 years working in finance and accounting with the likes of Arthur Anderson, Deloitte and the Chartered Institute of Management Accountants, as well as chairing voluntary groups. Naomi holds a Bachelor of Arts, Economics and Politics from the University of Leeds. Well, thank you so much for being willing to come on The Longest Day. Why don't you tell our listeners about your longest day? There was a day back in late 2019, um, Boris Johnson called a general election. And we have constituency level data, it's something we do at Best Written, that was telling us if he called an election, he would probably get an 81 seat majority. Lots of people did not believe us, from Liberal Democrats to others. And of course, he ended up with an 80 seat majority, but we really tried to stop that. And so my longest day is the day that we had got furious attack from the left of Labour for some of our tactical vote recommendations in 2019. That resulted in Guardian articles and an enormous online pile-on to tell us that we were dreadful, terrible, awful people who were going to be entirely to blame for a Boris Johnson majority, which, of course, was not only untrue, it was self-defeating for Labour people to be saying it and talking down a thing that was designed to help them. Um, so it was, it was a terrible day and I can go into more detail if you want me to, but that's the kind of the gist of it. It was, we'd, we'd planned to do a big tactical vote operation. We were doing it. We were doing it in order to do our level best to return as few Brexiter conservative MPs as possible and as many pro second referendum pro-European internationalist MPs, including One Nation Conservatives, to the Commons um, that would have you know, resulted, if it had worked perfectly, in many more Labour MPs than um, was eventually won in terms of seats for them um, and how some people in Labour decided to react really badly to it. You mentioned the media and the media is not renowned for its mercy. How long did the... I suppose vitriolic media coverage go on for? So most of the media was supportive. Um, We were lucky in that regard. I mean, when I say most of the media, the right-wing media were not, but they never are. And I'm only doing my job well if they're criticising us. Um, It was certain articles by commentators, so it wasn't sort of editorial decisions, um, by a few prominent left-wing Guardian commentators um, who went for it in an article or two, actually. Um, so I think in in totality, it was probably about two or three days of intense media nasty, but six weeks of horrible social media from, uh, I would say, hard left um, Twitter trolls um, and sometimes bots, but you know, it, it, mostly sort of staunch, hard left, angry tweeters um and that went on yeah for for the entire campaign and will even resurrect itself now Mm. four years later how did you deal with that at the time you go through a a really rapid grief cycle 
So you sort of are initially, you know, relieved that your thing is even being talked about and great and this is you know, all publicity is good publicity, then into anger um, that, uh, you know, th- this is an injustice and can't they see we're just trying to help them? And we are making hundreds and hundreds of Labour recommendations across the country, far more than any other party is getting. But just because in one seat where the polls were incredibly narrow, incredibly marginal, they decided that they were unhappy with the recommendation that we'd gone with. And we changed the recommendation, actually, um, in in their favour when we got a new poll back in just before polling day. Um, so, so, so you get this anger of like, for goodness sake, if you criticize this thing to this extent, you're hurting yourselves because it's going to, what you're trying to do is discredit the tool and the tool is designed specifically. And you can see that given the many, many hundreds of recommendations we're making for labor far more than any other party to, you know, to, to, to shoot yourselves in the foot because we had 45 million people use Mm -hmm. our tactical voting tool. One constituency got over 100,000 unique postcode lookups before the election. So um, you, you go from the, <laughs> the anger then into, oh, into depression. Uh, you're then really sad. You're sort of very self-reflective and like, oh, we didn't have the time to do enough stakeholder management before we launched this thing. You start to really blame yourself. And then you, you sort of go into acceptance of, okay, this is a couple of people who are very influential with certain parts of the left of Labour who have done their level best to criticise this. But let's remember, everyone's still using it. Most of the media are very supportive of it. Our donors are very happy with it. Our supporter base, you know, the people who are so critical to um, our operations are happy and eulogising about it and using it and telling other people to use it. So it, it's like a grief cycle, but within, you know, a couple of days. Now, then you you forget about it for a bit and then, the you know, it's somebody new will fire up on the angry part of the internet and try and re-traumatise you again. Were you able at all to empathise with where the, let's call them far left, were coming from? Yes, because I, I you know, I, I feel politics. Um, it, it's in your blood or it isn't. Um, what do I mean by that? I mean that when I wasn't working full time in politics, for, for listeners that don't know, I'm a recovering accountant. I spent most of my career in accounting and finance. Um, but I was a political junkie and junkies have to get their fix. So when you're doing a nine to five or, you know, whoever does a nine to five these days, I was working far more hours than that, but I would then have to get my fix in the evenings and weekends campaigning. Um, what do I mean by feeling it? The impotent fury when you have such strong values and convictions and a belief in how things could be done for the better of society but you have very few levers of control over that. You can you can get really angry and frustrated that to you it is so obvious what needs to be done. So mm-hmm. of course I understand that. I understand that, you know, they 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 had a leader in Jeremy Corbyn who finally, you know, they they found that they'd um taken back control of their party and in the direction that they wanted to and were sort of on hypervigilance for anything that might disrupt that victory. And we knew we needed to get Labour into a better position on a second referendum. So we were very much working with senior people in and around Jeremy Corbyn on all of that agenda. We think that it was madness for the Lib Dems to trigger the general election because if we'd boxed Boris Johnson in for longer, because remember they couldn't get anything through Parliament, Theresa May hadn't got that majority. Um, All of the different options that were being put to MPs around what to do in terms of interpreting the Brexit vote, what kind of Brexit to go for, we're, we're not getting a majority in Parliament. So there was this sort of stalemate. And we knew if we boxed him in for long enough, and, and really not much longer, we had the numbers to get the Labour Parliamentary Party into a majority position in favour of a second referendum. So, uh, yes, I had empathy for, for you know, that, that, oh, you're, you know, we know what we're doing, leave us alone, why are you interfering? I do understand that, but ultimately it was only ever going to hurt them. And that that they couldn't see that made me as frustrated with them as I'm sure they were with me. Mm, I can see that. What do you think you learned about yourself 
in that frustration of no one's listening and here's the information, here's the data. Yeah. So Aristotle says the power of persuasion, I think, is ethos, pathos and logos, right? So um, as a recovering accountant, one might correctly assume that logos is like my default. Like, this is logical. Here is the data. I am showing you evidence. Why can you not understand? You know, so I, I, I probably learned even more acutely that that is my default. Um, and that uh, ethos and shared values were, were, were definitely there with most of the people that we were trying to persuade to vote in a certain way. Um, but perhaps the uh, the pathos was where I needed to, to focus my attention a bit more and just have more empathy with where they might be coming from. Now, <sighs> that is tricky in an environment where you have multiple stakeholders with very different views and values and sets of desired outcomes. So it is disingenuous to try and be pathos, to, you know, empathetic to all of those um, because they, they conflict at times. But yeah, my my key learning was no one's ever going to worry about whether you've got the logic right on this. It, it's, it's how you've made them feel. So I, I now try to come at things a little bit more... Um, Soft powery is that a kind of word that makes any kind of sense, Leah? <laughs> we'll take soft power. Um, for those who don't know, maybe you can tell us a little bit about Best for Britain. Yeah, happy to. So um, our mission is to fix the problems Britain faces after Brexit. Um, our previous mission um, from 2017, when we were set up, until uh, Boris Johnson did then go ahead and get that 80 seat majority was to stop Brexit by any democratic means. So either through a, another vote or a general election that would have returned a, a more pro-European government. Um, so what are we? We are both a think tank and a campaign. And I'm sort of quite proud of that. People say, oh, well, I'm not really sure, what, you know, are you a think tank? Are you a sort of megaphone campaign? And the honest answer is that we're both. Um, <clears throat> so how how are we doing that? How are we trying to, to fix the problems Britain faces after Brexit? Well, we sort of have an insider and an outsider strategy like many organisations do. And the, the insider one being the, the lobbying efforts, the working with cross-party uh, parliamentarians to come up with policy solutions that will make <clears throat> trade easier uh, for exporters and importers, for attracting foreign direct investment into Britain, for plugging the skills gap that we've got across multiple sectors in the economy. So we, we do a lot of heavy policy work, um, taking evidence from businesses, experts, trade experts, academics all over the country, in Europe as well, to land on cross-sectoral policy recommendations that whether you're in fishing, farming, fin finance, fintech, pharmaceuticals, you agree would be a good thing for um, the current government or future government to do that stops short of renegotiating the whole Brexit deal, which Europe isn't offering uh, and, and you know our government and, and um, opposition parties aren't really pushing for either. So it's very pragmatic, very practical solutions of how can we make things better? How can we ease friction at the border? How can we help reduce uh, the red tape and the cost to the consumer? <laughs> Let's not forget. So that's kind of like the insider strategy, working really closely with lots of cross-party par parliamentarians to develop policy that can be put in opposition party manifestos or adopted by government itself. So for instance, the government has rejoined Horizon, um, which was something we left when we negotiated a really bad Brexit deal. And, and we've now rejoined, much to the relief of scientists and innovators and universities in the UK. And then the outside strategy is working with the country. Um, so we do loads of message testing, constituency level polling, focus groups um, and digital media ads to try and understand where people are, what they really think about a lot of this stuff. So if you take an average, say, you know, YouGov poll, it's probably about 2,000 people. We do 10,000, 20, 40,000 people polls. And then we do a statistical analysis that allows you to get a very, very much clearer picture of what's going on in an actual constituency. Because there's no point in us pushing for a more multilateralist, 
pro-European, work with the world, not against it agenda on the policy front if we're not bringing the country with us. Mm. So we do do a lot to try and make sure that, you know, Jane from Nuneaton, who might be a single parent mum, whose weekly shop now runs out on a Wednesday rather than a Friday, understands why that issue that hurts her and her family so much is connected to the political system, Mm. to the decisions that often Oxbridge Etonian guys are making, or Wickhamists or whatever you're meant to call somebody that went to Winchester, um, are making on on their behalf. And, you know, it's really hard to understand why trade policy would affect the price of something on the little shelf, Mm -hmm. but it does. Mm -hmm. And so we do a lot of very human story focused campaigning um to try and you know give people who have no time to get their heads around this stuff because most you know we have real poverty and we have time poverty um in this country they don't have time to sit and read all this stuff so we try and make it digestible Mm -hmm. easy for them to understand and because we're we've got great data about where people are we can target quite effectively and we get great kind of conversion metrics on our social media of those people clicking through because it's resonated with them and then signing up and then we can bring them into our wheelhouse, send them more information, Mm. get them writing to their MP. You know, if you or I write to our MP, the MP's like, oh, not her again. Uh, My my local MPs (laughs) definitely think that. (laughs) Whereas if Jane from Nuneaton, who's never written to her MP, suddenly does or writes the local paper, mm. or calls into the local radio station, a drive time show, all things that we, you know, run campaigns um, to get people to do, the MP is far more likely to take notice. Are you feeling stuck? Has conflict got you down? Have you considered mediation? Mediation is a confidential and flexible way to resolve conflicts. 86% of all mediations end in a solution saving time, money, and stress for all involved. Thanet Mediation Centre, a Broadstairs consulting initiative, offers mediation services to individuals and organisations in Thanet, Kent, and further afield. For more information or advice, email us at info at broadstairsconsulting.com. We are here to help you move forwards. You mentioned earlier that you're expecting similarly extreme views in the upcoming general election. How do you think your longest day has equipped you to sit in the increasing polarisation of our society? It's equipped me in the sense of, let's get ahead. Um, Let's plan further out many different scenarios. So because we live in this ridiculous system in the UK... Listeners, only the UK and Belarus use first past the post as their voting system uh, to elect a national government. Um, uh, And when the timing of the election is entirely at the mercy of the Prime Minister, we don't know when it's going to be. There are all sorts of rumours constantly about when it might be and speculation. um, And people saying, no, 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 I have a very good authority from senior Conservatives that it will be in... May and then other people saying I have an on even better authority that they're going to go right to the bitter end it'd be January 25 you know so it's hard to plan in that environment but what we've now got is not just our general election plan in a drawer that we can crack open once the the gun is fired multiple you know lo- lots of different scenarios of what if it's then what if it's this blah, blah, blah. so we're, we're more prepared and and that I think is helpful um I think in 2019, we felt we needed to be out early with all of our tactical vote recommendations because of Google, because search engine optimization is incredibly important. So when people type, where do I vote? How do I vote? Who should I vote for? I don't like my MP, who should I vote for? Any of those sorts of search terms, the people that are running the sites that have had the most traffic will be at the top of that. So we wanted to make sure that we were at the top because we knew we had great data, Mm -hmm. that we weren't basing our tactical vote recommendations based on the previous election. We were basing them on what is happening on the ground now in that constituency because so much changes between elections and far more 
between 2019 and 2024 election than would have been between 2017 and 2019, not because simply because it's been such a longer period of time, but because we've had the pandemic, people have left where they lived and now live and work very differently. So you've had demographic churn, you felt the impact of Brexit in terms of um, the, you know, the, the types of people who um, live in certain areas. We've had, you know, major shift in uh, in London in particular, I think this has been reported like up to a million Europeans have left the capital and things like that. So all sorts of things have changed and all of the party leaders have changed and the constituencies have changed. So you've had something called boundary changes, which means that your constituency name is different, where you might have to go to vote is different. So um, I think what we will do this time is instead of trying to be first out and top of the SEO, we're going to hang back, poll as late as possible but still in time for people who do postal vote a couple of weeks before polling day, before we release what our recommendations are going to be. Um, and that allows us in that poll to pick up something called the squeeze. So uh, forgive me if I'm teaching grammar, this is suck eggs, but once an election is called, um, the parties squeeze each other's votes. So for instance, in a Labour Conservative marginal seat, Labour will be trying to squeeze any Green and Lib Dem vote down to almost nothing by saying, look, they can't win here. If you want to get rid of the Conservatives, you have to vote for us. Similarly, in a Lib Con seat, they'll be squeezing Labour votes. So what we have to try and do when we're doing constituency level recommendations is wait for some of the impact of that squeeze to start, then poll, then say, right, who's really in second place here or who's really uh, you know, going, going to be at most threat from... Um, a conservative winning in order to give them the recommendation. So that is kind of the aim and how we've learned from last time about mm. what to try and avoid. Are you expecting a similar backlash in respect of tactical voting? <laughs> Not maybe from the same quarters. So I think the right will be much more aggressive about it this time. Um, last time and the time before, you had the, let's call them the Farragista, because whether it's UKIP, Brexit Party or Now Reform UK, because, you know, he keeps reinventing himself under different umbrellas. Um, Most notably the I'm a Celebrity umbrella. Indeed. Boycott it. Bad ITV. Naughty. Against your values. Shouldn't have had him on. Um, uh, they stood candidates down in 2017 and 2019 to help the Conservatives out. They were like, we're not going to send, send anyone down. We're not, we're not, we're not. And then right at the last minute... Farage pulled out hundreds of candidates in the knowledge that most Brexit Party candidates without a, sorry, most Brexit Party voters without a Brexit Party candidate's back would flip to the Conservatives. And our data shows about 75% transfer occurs when the more right-wing party pulls out in favour of the very right-wing party that we now have in the Conservatives. Um, so... Uh, now, we don't know this time. There's a lot of noise from Richard Tice, who is the technical leader of Reform UK, um, and Farage and friends, that they are going to stand as many candidates as possible and they won't be standing down this time, even if it delivers the Labour government. Um, so I think we're going to assume that they will pull them out because we have to assume on the basis of a worst-case scenario. Um, but I think we'll we'll feel far more anger and wrath from the right and the far right um, than we did, than we will from from the left this time. Um, and you will also get people saying, no, my tactical vote site's better than your tactical vote site. And that, you know, won't be the sort of same level of anger, but it's kind of noise and competition and distraction that, that perhaps you, you don't need. We will base ours on incredibly good data. So, you know, that me back to my Logos, um, <laughs> wanting to make sure as evidence-led as possible um, with our recommendations. So who knows? I, I hope, I hope not. It's going to be a challenge. <laughs> Last question for you. If you had to live your longest day again, what food would you choose to fuel it? Oh, man. That is a brilliant question because in campaigning, notoriously, everybody eats appallingly. Um, you know, pizza in the office at 11 o'clock at night and cold pizza for breakfast the next day. And it's terrible. It's terrible for nutrition, energy levels, all the rest of it. 
So, um, oh, I'm such a foodie. I bloody love questions like this. Um, I think we're gonna we're gonna start the day with like a lovely chia pudding made with like oat milk, loads of berries. Keep me going through the day. Um, we're going to have a jam-packed salad at lunchtime with loads of great plant-based proteins in it, like roasted chickpeas, hummus, all that kind of stuff. Um, if we need a little pick-me-up in the afternoon, which we will, we're probably going to go for like, I don't know, some nice, healthy like granola bar I mean they're not that healthy but you know a bit and then for dinner I'm gonna have oh I'm gonna I'm gonna order because we're gonna be working late in the office um like Middle Eastern fair and we'll have like great Levantine food Ooh, that yeah nice. yeah that kind of that kind of vibe because you don't feel you, you feel really nourished and full but you don't feel kind of I'm gonna go into a food coma now like you would if you'd ordered in like a really heavy curry or something else so yeah i love I'm that trying think, to be healthier think how much better our national decisions could be if all of the people working <laughs> on the outcomes were properly nourished yeah. oh, love that well thank you so much for your time thank you for sharing a bit about well i suppose your challenging experiences in the last election and well look forward to seeing what happens next thank you leah thanks for having me on You've been listening to a Broadstairs Consulting Limited podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. Tune in soon to hear the next instalment of The Longest Day. Copyright 2023. Production copyright. Broadstairs Consulting Limited. All rights reserved.